Why Do We Do That, a psychology podcast that deconstructs human behavior from the perspectives of social scientists, psychologists, and others that use applied psychology in their work. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Moyer. In this episode, I sat down with Dr. Susan Golden Meadow to discuss her research on the use of gesture in early childhood communication. Susan is the Beardsley Rummel Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of Psychology and Committee on Human Development at the University of Chicago. Her research on language development has been funded by the National Science Foundation, the Spencer Foundation, the March of Dimes, the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, and the National Institute of Neurological and Communicative Disorders and Stroke. Susan has won numerous awards for both research and teaching, including the prestigious 2021 Rummel Hart Prize in Cognitive Science, awarded annually to an individual or collaborative team making a significant contemporary contribution to the theoretical foundations of human cognition. She is also the founding editor of Language Learning and Development, the official journal of the Society for Language Development. Her newest book is entitled Thinking with Your Hands, The Surprising Science Behind How Gestures Shape Our Thoughts, and was the focus of our conversation. One key takeaway I had from our discussion was the strength of the mind-body connection. We sometimes draw distinctions between what our mind is doing and what our body is doing. But after my chat with Susan, it is clear that these systems work together to develop our language and communication skills. Also, it was enlightening to learn that gesturing goes far beyond the common symbols we consciously use to communicate to others, such as thumbs up or the OK symbol. Gesturing can often be automatic and spontaneous, reflecting in real time how our brains are conceptualizing the ideas we are communicating with our words. Furthermore, Susan's work emphasizes some practical benefits of paying more attention to the gestures produced by children at home and in school. While adults use gesturing regularly to supplement speech, gesturing is critical during childhood, helping kids to understand language and work through abstract ideas, even in surprising domains like mathematics. Decoding these gestures can help us communicate better with kids and support their learning of new concepts. If you want insight into how children think about the world and what their gestures reveal about their thoughts, this episode should provide some clarity. Enjoy. Okay, today I am here with Susan Golden Meadow. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Susan uh, has a, a book out called Thinking with Your Hands, The Surprising Science Behind How Gestures Shape Our Thoughts. And so today we're going to be talking about gestures, uh, what they help us communicate, uh, what they, uh, the importance of gestures in child development and a whole bunch of other uh, related topics. Why don't we start off by uh, giving an overview of what gestures are and specifically how are gestures different from other types of nonverbal communication? Okay, that's a, a very good question. I mean, gesture is a type of nonverbal communication. Um, it is has been categorized in many different ways, and there are many different ways of looking at it. I mean, the face is part of gesture, uh, but I focus primarily on what the hands do. And I look particularly at what the hands do when we're talking. I mean, there are a lot of things that we do with our bodies. We position them in particular ways, um, which happen when we're in social situations or non-social situations, but we're not talking. And the things that I'm most interested in happen when your hands accompany speech. 
are are people aware of their gestures because it seems very very reflexive that there isn't a lot of you know there's not a lot of thought going in to them and uh from what we know from other areas of psychology you know people are not really good at explaining automatic processes or why automatic things happen uh so i'm curious right. you know if you gave somebody a, a little opportunity to explain some of their common gestures would they be able to to do it accurately um cuz you know i have i have i know i have one common gesture which is uh when i'm helping to remember things i'll spin my hand towards the 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 listener i'm doing it now on the camera um right. and i would i think i know what it means i think it's just sort of helping me you know produce linear pieces of information but are we aware and and do we have access to what these gestures do at, at a lay level I don't think we do have much access. We obviously have access to gestures that are conventionalized. So things like the okay sign, you know, mm -hmm. or the things are great sign or shh, you know, these are conventionalized gestures that you make um, that are actually quite specific to a culture. And when you do them, you you know, you're doing them. They're They're like words. Right. Um, but the gestures that I'm interested in, and I think that you're talking about, spontaneously occur with speech. Um, and I'm most interested in those spontaneous gestures because I think they do reflect our thinking. Um, and they do reflect things that we don't know, always know we're thinking. So I'm interested in how we can find out about the mind by looking at the hands. So it, it seems as though there are two sort of broad aspects of communication where we can see impacts from gestures. One being for the listener, we're communicating extra things that the that would help the listener understand what we're saying, but also we're in, in yeah. many ways, we're helping ourselves think. Let's start there with the helping ourselves think. Um, could you talk a little okay. bit about how gestures can impact things like uh, like our memory recall and, and formulating ideas? Right. Let, first, let me give you the bit of evidence that suggests we really do gesture for ourselves and not always for other people. Um, we've done work on people who are congenitally blind. They've never, ever seen anybody gesture. And, and the study that we did, the blind people were talking to other blind people. So there's no way in which the gestures that they produced were useful for anybody else, for their listener. Nonetheless, the blind people would gesture, and they gestured pretty much like sighted people. So that certainly suggests that our gestures aren't always for other people. We gesture on the phone. You know, we gesture when people aren't around. Um, so it suggests that gesture is doing something for us. I think that we know that gestures can help us focus our attention. It can help us remember things. It might even lighten our cognitive load. Gestures do lots of things for us um, as thinking uh, thinkers. And it may uh, actually help us learn. Um, that's one of the things that that I've been focusing on, how gestures may play a role in learning. I was wondering if it's similar to sort of adding a song to memory in the sense of if I'm trying to memorize a lot of information uh, without a song versus the same amount of information, but I add a you know, uh, either a mnemonic device, you know, right. so the Roy G. Right. Biv, or if I add a song, technically I'm adding information. So you might think, oh, well, that might actually make it harder to to okay. yeah. to to recall. But is it, are, are gestures doing something similar where it's it's allowing a, a more organized knowledge structure? I think that's just right. I mean, I think the you could say naively, well, you're gesturing and you're talking, you're doing two things that can make it harder to think things through. But in fact, I think we have lots of good evidence that it makes gesturing makes it easier. And I think for the reasons that you suggest, it helps you synchronize, bring it together, 
uh, it, it works synergistically with speech. I don't know that it works in the same way that a song works, but I think it definitely works sort of at some level, it works in the same way that a song works um, in that it, 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 it's not adding effort. It's just working to, to bring it all together um, and helping you think things through. Now, are there, is there a catalog of sort of the categories of gestures in the sense of, you know, as I was about halfway through your book, I was just starting to think of all of the categories that there could possibly be with respect to gestures. You know, we communicate size, uh, we communicate emphasis sometimes when we're, you know, sort of making that gesture with our index finger and our thumb and we're pressing it together like we're squishing a bug where it's like, I'm making a very specific point here. Um, sometimes we're conveying steps, like, like we're, I'm sort of chopping a log here. Um, are Is there a sort of full understanding of these categories? And uh, if there if there isn't, is there anything very surprising to you that... Uh, over the course of your research that you've come across that uh, that surprised you about, oh, we actually communicate this idea via gesture. That's that that was a, a bit of a shock. So I think the the gestures that can be categorized are the ones I mentioned earlier, the emblems and there and books have been written about emblems and how they look and how they differ, you know, and you can how you can get yourself into trouble in one culture if you use the gesture of another culture and things like right. that. For the spontaneous gestures that I'm interested in, there are sort of gross categorizations that are pretty obvious. There are didactic or pointing gestures. Um, there are representational gestures like iconic gestures that are their metaphoric gestures of the sort that you were talking about. There's, I think that there's a, an infinite number of them because you can do anything with your hands. Um, it, it, you can paint a picture, you can do anything that you want with your hands. So I would be surprised. I mean, I've thought about this. I thought, are there any ideas that you cannot express in gesture? Um, and I think most ideas can be, even things that are very, very abstract, that you end up thinking about them in a spatial way. You know, if you think about um, moral development and moral issues we've we've tested people on moral decision making and what they do is they lay things out with their hands so if they're talking about two people or two points of view they lay it out in space or they bring it to themselves it's a very abstract idea but they concretize it by putting it into space and i can't imagine anything that you can't do that to right. so i would be surprised if you can't at least get a, a bit of your idea out in gesture. Maybe not all of it, but. Yeah, I, I was really fascinated with a couple of individual points in the book. One being this idea of communicating perspective taking. So the, <laughs> the gesture being sort of, um, as you just pointed out, creating space where you're like, over here is one thought and over, uh, you know, on, the, on my left is this one idea. And on this right is a different idea. Could you talk a little bit more about about what what the research showed with respect to this perspective taking and and moral uh, implications? Well, I think there that there are two things here. I think that we all we all when we talk, we often lay our ideas out on the right or the left or wherever, um, and I think. Uh, I think it's a good idea if you're going to do that to try to be consistent. You know, if I put, if I'm talking about mothers and children, I put mom on the right side and children on the left, I should try to do that consistently over my lecture or people get confused. Uh -huh. But the moral reasoning was a little different. What we were doing with the moral reasoning is we looked at kids who just really were at, at a, a low stage um, where they would only take their own perspective in dealing with this moral dilemma. And we asked them to gesture when they described, we, we gave them the little training. We asked them to gesture when they told the story and whatever. And they, they when they did, did gesture, they started to put ideas out in two hands. They started mm. to use both of their hands and put ideas out or do it in two places. And when they did that, they actually 
change some of their thoughts and they got a little bit more multi-perspective, even in their speech. Mm. And the children who we did not force to gesture didn't do that. Yeah, it's it's almost okay. like, yeah, it's, it's almost, I mean, did you, would you describe it as they were reminded that there were two perspectives? I'm trying, because like I can picture, you know, right. I can picture a kid, yeah. you kind of give them this idea and, and they, they're, they're testing it out and it's like, oh, well, they're unlocking thoughts that they, right. that were in there the whole time. Yep. I think that is the big question. Are they okay. just... I mean, clearly the kids at that moment um, couldn't easily express the ideas. Maybe they had these ideas, um, but they're locked in there for some way reason. Um, and Jester is allowing them to get it out. Um, the other possibility is that they're creating the ideas with Jester. We don't know which it is. Um, we have a little bit of evidence that Jester may be creating the ideas in some math tasks or helping the children generate the ideas to begin with in a math task, not in the moral reasoning task. But I think that that's you're just right. Those are the two possibilities. Either Jester is sort of releasing an idea that seems to be trapped in in uh, in your mind and not expressible, or it's helping you create and and develop that idea. Either way, it's pretty useful. So. So speaking of of useful gestures, I I was very curious if if gestures can vary in terms of their quality. So I, what I'm getting at is uh, I'm curious if some people are bad at gesturing. So yeah, it, 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 yeah. yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say it's a really good question. We know very little about it, so keep asking. Go ahead. Oh, well, yeah, that's interesting because I, I was thinking, you know, if, if I wanted to research how studying influences test performance, and I say to one group, "You go study," and then the other, I don't say study, and I don't if I don't find any differences, it's not necessarily because studying doesn't work, right? Because I let them do this, their own study habits, like they right, were, right, which right, could be right, right. not studying at all. And right. so I was trying to think if gesturing is the same way, where if you tried to measure the influence of gesturing on communication, do at some point, do you have to go back and go, well, are they gesturing effectively? Is this group, you know, this person or this group of individuals, they're, they're doing quote unquote, a good, objectively good or objectively useful gestures, whereas some others aren't. Yeah. Okay. There are a lot of things, a lot of things uh, that you're, you're mentioning here. I think let's go back for a minute and, and talk a little bit about what role the gesture can play in learning. So one of the big phenomena that we've discovered is that sometimes you can express an idea with speech and a different idea in gesture about a particular task. And when you do that, you're in transition. So you're, you're ready to learn that task. So there, what Jester is doing is telling your teacher or your mother or your friend that you're on the verge of learning something and they can then provide instruction, any kind of instruction or input or whatever, which will help you learn. And we have evidence for that. So when we find children who we call mismatchers because their gesture and their speech mismatch uh, versus matchers, we give them all instruction and it's the mismatchers who learn, who are more likely to learn. Okay. So that's one role that gesture can play. It just tells the world what's on our minds. But the other role that gesture can play that you're talking about more is whether the act of gesturing itself helps you learn. Okay, so we do find that people who gesture um, on a task do better. But as you've pointed, as you just pointed out, you don't know what that means really. Um, right. They could be gesturing well, the other people could be, you know, a, a potentially gesturing, but they're not. I mean, they've chosen, maybe it's the people who uh, gesture who are better at learn at knowing the problem, and it's not the gesturing per se. So we've gotten around that by teaching children gestures. So we teach them a gesture to do on a particular task, and um, then we see how well they learn that task. We give them input. So we give half of the children gestures to produce along with speech 
and half of the children just the speech. And they, you know, they do it during the training and during the instruction. Mm -hmm. And in general, it's the children who have gotten the gestures, who are producing the gestures or seeing the gestures, who do better on the task. So the act of gesturing in that case, and we know we're controlling it. So we know it really is the act of gesturing is helping the children pick up information from the instruction. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's very interesting, like this this idea that you can actually teach gesturing at all. Um, so sticking with these ch uh, child populations, um, what to what extent do children pick up gestures naturally? So what are we what what do they have without any sort of teaching to start with? Oh, they well, children gesture spontaneously and they gesture before they're they talk for the most part. Most children do. They you know, they point, they hold up gestures, they you know, hold up objects, they do a little give gesture, you know, extending their palm. Um, and that all happens way before they start to talk. And then their first steps forward are to combine gestures and speech, um, often redundantly point at a, 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 a cup and say cup, or later point at a cup and say mommy to mean that it's mommy's cup. So that so their first sentences come about in these gesture speech combinations. You don't have to teach gesture. Right. Gesture comes spontaneously. The only reason that we teach gesture is to get control over it and to manipulate it so that we can be sure it's the gesturing that's doing the work and not the child's uh you know inclination before the gesture. Now in, in the book you spend a lot of time talking about this uh, this very specific population of home signers. So this idea that uh, while some children, uh, some deaf children might grow up and be formally taught sign language, there are other children that grow up in an environment that aren't formally taught sign language. And in the book, you talk about all these insights that you can get from looking at these home signers. Could you talk about this population a little bit more? Sure. Um, this is actually where I began. I mean, I began my interest in hands and gestures with these children because what I the question I was really interested in is how much of language could a child invent if they were deprived of a language model? You know, everybody gets a language model. Everybody hears something. Everybody hears a language, even these deaf children. But these particular deaf children have uh, hearing losses that are so profound, they can't make use of the spoken language. Uh -huh. And they're they were born to hearing parents, so their parents didn't expose them to a sign language. So they were essentially without a language model. So I was interested in seeing how much of language could they recreate. Um, and that's how, what I've spent a lot of time doing, looking at what they can do. And they can do quite a bit. I mean, not they don't invent a full-blown language, but they can do a lot of the fundamental properties of language. Mm -hmm. I got into gesture, the gestures that accompany speech, because I needed to compare them to somebody. So maybe their gestures look just like the gestures that hearing kids produce when they're acquiring language. Um, so I would compare them to the gestures that hearing children produce. Maybe their gestures look just like their hearing parents' gestures. So I started looking at their hearing parents' gestures. So I got interested in the gestures that accompany speech, almost as a contrast group for these gestures that were produced without speech and without any sort of language model. And how and how similar how similar are they? I mean, okay, not similar. Um, so th that uh, uh, the home signs are really much more; their gestures are much more discreet. So they're like little beads on a string okay. rather than fluid movements. I mean, they're, they're iconic, of course, because if these deaf children didn't create an iconic gesture that looked like what it was about, um, they wouldn't be understood. But instead of just sort of doing a whole reenactment of how to eat an apple, they might point at the apple and then do a tiny little jab toward their mouth with a fist to show eating the apple. And that's quite different from... Um, what a mime might do. Mm -hmm. um, and hearing kid gestures, they certainly do point and they certainly hold up gestures. But our gestures tend to be much more 
uh, mimetic, much more graphic. They 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 are they flow more. They aren't they aren't divided into components in the same way that the deaf children's gestures are. And the so these home signers um, is feedback a big part of the development of their gestures. In other words, if you were to go one level deeper into home signers, you might find one group is of home signers where they're getting sort of, let's just say active feedback from their parent about, you know, they, you know, they grab their child's hands and say, this is, this is what I want you to do to communicate this um, versus the absence of any sort of feedback. Um, is, is that a, a, do you see clear differences between those groups? Okay. So first of all, these kids are being orally trained. Okay. In other words, they're they're being taught to speak. So their parents are not interested in, in their gestures and they would never tell them how to gesture something. But that doesn't mean they don't get feedback. I mean, they might get feedback, you know, if, if the kid uh, says something that's particularly clear, the mother then follows. And if it's not very clear, the mother doesn't do it or things like that. We're actually, we are now uh, going back to our old tapes to look at this more carefully, to look at very subtle cues that the parents might be giving them. We know that it's not, there's not, it, it doesn't work in a very gross way. So if the kid points at a glass and does a drink gesture, mm-hmm. And that's the order they tend to do. They point at an object and then do the action. They point at that, or if they do do the glass gesture first and then point at the cup, parents respond either way because it's pretty obvious. This is not astrophysics here. It's pretty obvious what the kid is saying. And so it doesn't really matter whether it's ordered one way or the other. Mm. Nonetheless, the kids order it in that way. But I think there may be more subtle things things that the parents are doing just to sort of convey communication where the parents might differ. So we're going back to the videotapes and we're going to spend a lot of time trying to see if you're correct that uh, feedback really matters. Yeah. So the, uh, the way that you lay out the book, uh, I think my, my favorite uh, part was the third part of the book where you talked about um, some some ways that we can use our knowledge about gesturing to improve the world. And, you know, you start talking about, about parents and uh, knowing that gesturing can be this, um, this method of communication that children develop before their words, there, there's some implications there. Um, and so let's, let's first talk about um baby signing a little bit because I found that super interesting, um, which is sort of, I, I don't, I'm not, I actually don't know anything about baby signing. I, I've seen it in a movie maybe once or twice where you see the, the parents that, that teach some very basic signs to their children. Um, do we, do we know that this baby signing has an impact on development? Um, we've looked hard for evidence that it, so when you teach the kids the baby signs, the kids learn the baby signs. So it does have an impact in that sense. Okay. But the question that most people are interested in is, does it um, help the child learn a spoken language? And it right. doesn't seem to speed the child up. But I think importantly, it doesn't slow the child down either. So you know, and and often it, it eases communication. It makes parents feel better. Um, it it just is a good means by which people can communicate with their young children, and it doesn't slow them down. So I wouldn't use baby sign because you think it's going to help them learn spoken language, but it doesn't hurt to use it, and it may you know make it a little easier to interact with your child. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is some you, you talked a little bit about uh, in the book about uh, about parents who understand their children's gestures versus parents that don't. Um, could you talk about that evidence? Do we, do we actually see that, that children from p- parents who understand their gestures uh, show uh, some sort of development benefits? So uh, it's much more focused than that. I mean, there okay. aren't children whose parents are just out to lunch and don't understand a gesture. Um, but you might, so we might look at children, <clears throat> excuse me, at their speech. 
Um, so the child um, points at a cup, you know, um, and the mother labels it. Oh, that's a cup. One mother does, another mother doesn't. Or the child, you know, uh, points at a cup and says, mommy. And one mother says, oh, that's mommy's cup. And another mother doesn't. So what we can do is look, compare the two sets of children at a given moment in time. And the, the mothers who translate those gestures into speech at the right moment, you know, because that's really the moment the kid needs the word cup, their kids acquire the words faster. They acquire two words faster. So it's not yeah. like parents are, you know, just I don't know what a gesture is. It's just they're timely in how they respond to those gestures. And that to help else move along. You know, can you learn without gesture? Of course. But it does help the kid move along. Yeah. It's, and it seems as though like there, there is a lot of opportunity there to uh, to validate these gesture offerings. Like it, part of it, part of me thinks of, um, you know, if you just define learning in general, you have to you have to acknowledge that making errors and learning in real time, like just I've just made a mistake, that's a big part of learning. And it seems as though with with when children are making gestures, you can just by validating and say, yes, that's mommy's cup, that you're um you're sort of I guess smoothing the trans the learning path a little bit. Right. Right. I think what you're doing is, is the kid may not, the kid at that point cannot say mommy's cup. He can say the word mommy, he can say the word cup, but he doesn't put it together. Right. So what you're doing is sort of giving the child just the right piece of um, evidence that, you know, this is the sentence that you should produce mommy's cup. So you're really, I think you're right. You're, you're, you're making the transition easier by giving the, child timely input and what you're doing is using what the child expresses with his hands to tell you about what the child is thinking right that's what you're really doing you know it's hard to creep into a child's head but when the child expresses something with their hands and not with their mouths if you're attentive to those hands you say ah yes he's thinking about the cup or he's mm -hmm. thinking about the dog or, you know, whatever. And then you can speak to that and you can have a little conversation about it. So knowing that, that gesturing behavior will, will come before language or spoken language, it seems as you suggest in the book possible that you can use gestures to potentially diagnose or predict uh, early learning difficulties. Uh, could you yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, we have a little bit of evidence for that um, in a group. It's a small group, but a group of brain injured children. Um, we ha we have been following a lot of children, sixty kids over a period of you know many years, typically developing children. So we know a lot about what the normal range is for word learning and what the normal range is for gesture learning. Okay, so what we did with these brain injured children is we looked at them at age 18 months and we found that they were all at the very low end or below the norm for word learning. Okay, but interestingly, the two brain injured, the brain injured groups divided into two on the basis of gesture. Some kids produce gesture in the normal range and some kids produce gesture at the low end of the range. So they're all over words, but they differ with respect to gesture. Then we look 30, at 30 months, so, you know, a, a bit later. And what we found is that the kids who produced gesture at the, the normal range had moved into the normal range for word learning. Oh. They did not, they were no longer delayed and they'd become um, like typically developing kids. On the other hand, the kids who were at the low range for gesture at 18 months remained at the low range for word learning at 30 months. So what the gesture was doing was showing or giving us a flag that these kids are going to turn out to be just fine. Don't worry about them. Just leave them alone. But these kids could use some intervention. So if you're going to intervene, intervene with these kids. 
Um, so I think if we pay attention to gesture, sometimes we can see when kids are not gesturing that at least we should pay attention, you know, and, and maybe take a look and see if the kid is doing okay. Now, I don't want to go too much into the the, the neuroscience of, of this, but I, I have to I have to ask, do we know the parts of the brain that are responsible for gesture versus because I mean, we know that there are specific areas for language. Um, but I'm curious now if if the same areas light up when kids are gesturing or if it's a different part of the brain. So that's a really hard question to answer because gesture co-occurs with language. So when the kids are producing gesture, they're also talking. When the kids are watching gesture, they're also listening to language. So it's a really tricky question. We do know that the, the same areas are, are activated, but we don't know whether, you know, there are other ways of, of going about it. And if you separate gesture from speech, it's not really the same thing as co-speech gesture. Um, so I think it's a tricky kind of question. We are now beginning to look at what the brain is doing when a child says one thing in speech and gestures something else, else in a math task, as opposed to a child who says the same thing in both gesture and speech. Right. And we're trying to see if there, if the, if we can figure out what the brain is doing when gesture is saying something different from speech, that may give us a handle on that question. But just looking at speech and gesture together, it's, it's just not, um, it's not parsable. Yeah. No, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I can see. I mean, it it definitely feels as though the gesturing is is more primitive, but that doesn't mean it's going to live in a completely different area in the brain, right? Right, and I I don't know what I mean. In what sense do you mean primitive? Well, I mean, I think it's it, well, I think it would it would de definitely come first in the develop. We I mean, we do know it comes first in the developmental process. Um, right, right. So maybe primitive is the wrong word. I don't. Yeah, I don't. It, it has a different format. You know, it's not categorical and discrete and rule governed in the same way that language is. Um, but it is representational. It does represent things. Um, it just represents things in a different way. I I think that what's important to our communication is that we have both vehicles. We have both the language, which is more categorical. And then we also have this gesture, which is more mimetic and pictorial. Um, and that both are really important to conversation. Now, you also talk about um, some tips for teachers in the classroom, how they can sort of incorporate some gesturing or at least awareness of their students' gestures. Um, you actually mentioned sort of a there was a five minute training period, um, which actually had some benefits, which I love to hear stories about, about, you know, studies that, that find a benefit from training. Uh, yeah, could you talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about some of the, the classroom stuff that, that you've seen? Yeah, we, we didn't actually do this in a classroom, but we did uh, train teachers and we trained, you know, just college undergraduates, um, and what we did was, you know, we, we went all the, the, the gamut from just saying, hey, next time you look at these things, why don't you pay attention to gesture, to teaching them about the particular gestures that they were going to see. Now, obviously, if you teach them about the gestures they're going to see, they're going to get better the next time around. Um, but even a hint, just saying pay attention to gesture, up their intake of gesture. Now, people are pretty good to begin with. I mean, I, I think we're very good at reading gesture, uh, but we're, you know, we can always improve. Um, and we got teachers and undergraduates to get a little bit better and in, in understanding what the children were saying with their hands. Could you give a just maybe one example of 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 a gesture that you might see a school age child using that may be may be confusing or unnoticed by 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 somebody um i know that you know you've talked about before that that there's some um you know you can communicate uh groups of numbers and stuff like that when when they're talking about math but i, I was just curious if there was um, a concrete example of something that children use very commonly in the classroom or when they're learning 
what depends on what you're learning, you know? Um, so the gestures are, are specific to the task. Um, I don't know that any these gestures are, I mean, some gestures are very confusing. They're floating all around. You have no idea what they're saying. And we don't have any idea what they're saying either. But sometimes they're quite clear and the teachers might or might not notice. Okay, so let me give you an example from uh, this. It's a task that Jean Piaget developed, you know, called conservation of liquid. You know, you take water in a long, thin container and you pour it into a flat you know, a, a shorter, wider container. Okay. Right. And then uh, kids, little kids think that the water's changed. There's a different amount of water in the two containers. Right. Um, so, and you ask them why, and they say, well, because this one's taller than this one. And they hold it, they indicate the height of the water in one hand and the width, uh, the, sorry, the height of the other water in the high, the tall height in one hand and the short height in the other hand of the two mm -hmm. containers. Okay. Right. That's a kid who's, you know, and that's perfectly fine. And you can understand that he's been redundant saying the same thing in speech and gesture. But other kids will do the following. They'll say it's different because this one's taller and they'll indicate the skinny width of that tall container. Mm -hmm. And this one's shorter and they'll indicate the width, the, the wider width of that shorter container. So what they're doing is they're focusing on height in their words, but on width in their gestures. Okay. I okay. mean, and that might go unnoticed, but, but if you notice it, you can see that that kid is already understanding that there are two dimensions here, that when you pour water, you have to think about mm -hmm. the fact that it's taller, but it's also thinner. Whereas this one is shorter, but it's also wider. And that's yeah. the beginning of understanding the conservation of no, of water, of liquid quantity. Yeah. And, you know, with that example, I'm starting to get a, a much clearer picture of how gesturing can help with learning. You know, I'm thinking of sort of you, you have a child build a specific structure with some blocks and then you knock it down. And then you say, you know, can you do this exact, can you do this again? So oftentimes mm -hmm. they might be confident that they can do it again, or maybe they're, they're doubtful that they can do it again. But, um, but by learning, it, it seems as though sometimes kids will learn if their confidence matches their ability. So they, they try it again and it's like, oh, that was difficult. It's like, it feels like learning. It feels like that's what learning is. And it, it, it reminded me of those, those mismatches of what they're saying uh, when they're communicating versus what their hands are, are indicating. Is that, is, is that a similar idea? It is, but confidence works the other way. So okay. the mismatchers, if you just have people look at these kids, the ones who mismatch, the ones who match, you don't tell them anything about gesture, they will rate the matchers as more confident than the mismatchers. Because in a way, the mismatchers know too much. They know more than the matchers. They know about height and width. The matchers only know about height. And so they're, they're looking for information. I think they're more open to instruction because they are a little less confident about what they know. It's, they're sort of- Indicative, yeah. It, it reminds me of uh, the Dunning-Kruger effect where um where the confidence is negatively associated with knowledge and so you know people that that have low knowledge in a subject are unaware of how much they don't but know they don't. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah, it yeah. seems very similar to that in a sense yes except i don't know that they are aware of this at all. I think it's all very, we are look, now looking for some nonverbal cues in the face to show whether the kids are a little troubled by this, you know, or a little, uh, uh, the mismatches show a little bit of concern or, or a query or something in their face. But I don't know. I don't know. May not at all. It, they may not have any awareness at any point other than in their hands that they have this knowledge that they can use. So to wrap up, um, I'm curious if let's let's uh, expand out a little bit and look at, uh, at look at culture, look at uh, evolution of gestures over time. Uh, I'm curious in all of your research and and 
uh, and, and knowledge about gestures. Have Are you aware of any novel gestures that have sort of popped into existence that m- might be related to a cultural trend or a cultural development in, in sort of the same way that every year we add new words to the dictionary and you read a pop culture article saying, you know, um, you know, the word woke is, is made it into culture. It's a brand right. new word right, um, right, right. For, for, for people that are curious about a, adult gesturing. Um, are you aware of any new gestures that have just sort of come on to into into culture yeah that's an interesting question you know and i pay a lot less attention to the gestures that um stick around to the ones that care less about i care about the spontaneous ones but i bet there are some emblems that are cropping up now um i can't think of any offhand i don't know for new for new ideas i don't know i i really haven't thought about these situations where we we gesture instead of speaking or along with speaking so maybe right. there'll be a gesture for woke That's <laughs> a, you know. yeah well i mean yeah i guess I, it it wouldn't surprise me if if there wasn't a lot of change i mean it would be i mean part of me says well it, it's like emotions it's like we don't have new emotions per se um, we, you know, that's just, it's a sort of our hard wiring. But, but I think, but I think we would have new gestures if we have new ideas, um, both spontaneous gestures and even ones that get culturally sort of um, enforced, you know, or, or they become cultural icons. Um, I could imagine that will change. Why not? The spontaneous gestures will change if new cultural ideas come into being, you know, and as you grow and learn new things, your gestures will change because you're right. Because gestures just reflecting your thinking, which is why it's interesting. It reflects your thinking. So if your thinking changes, it's going to be reflected in the gestures that you produce and they will change over development and they may change over cultures as new cultures develop new ideas. The, the part about gesture that gets me excited, both that it reflects what we're thinking, but that it can also be used to change our thinking, um, either in the gestures that we give children or, or any, this isn't really about kids. This is about anybody who gestures and thinks. Um, so we give them gestures and that can change their minds. They can produce their own gestures and that can change their minds. So it, it's a double-edged sword there. And that's why I find it exciting. Well, I, I find it exciting as well. Uh, thank you so much for being on. Uh, again, uh, the book is Thinking With Your Hands, The Surprising Science Behind How Gestures Shape Our Thoughts. Um, uh, my apologies to the listeners for only releasing the audio version. The uh, uh, I, I do not release a video version, which I'm sure you would have found a lot easier to follow, but hopefully there's not uh, too many uh, parts that, that were, were confusing. Uh, thank you so much for joining me, uh, Susan Golden Meadow. Thank you. It was a pleasure. on Susan and her work, pick up Thinking With Your Hands, The Surprising Science Behind How Gestures Shape Our Thoughts, wherever books are sold. If you enjoy this podcast, please share an episode with two of your friends. Follow the Why Do We Do That Facebook page for updates and additional content. Don't forget to rate and write a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow on Instagram at Why Do We Do That Podcast or X at WDWDT pod. As always, feel free to email me with comments or guest suggestions at why do we do that podcast at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Dr. Ryan Moyer, hoping you found some answers to the question, why do we do that? Mm-hmm.